Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Dolores Donnelly, Community Development Officer with Armagh City Banbridge and Gregavon Borough Council. Welcome to tonight's lecture series, lecture, which is the final night of our series. Um, our speaker tonight is David Broderick. David's title is The American Wake, Stories and Traditions of Irish Immigration, including the Great Irish Famine. Um, David previously, uh, was well, sorry, currently is... Um, he has a master's in public history and cultural heritage from the University of Limerick. And he formerly was a researcher at the Irish Workhouse Centre in Pertumna, County Galway. And he's actually currently writing his second book on footsteps of the famine. Uh, David, if you want to start your talk whenever you're ready, that'd be great. OK, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Oh, Thanks. sorry. I just also mentioned, sorry, briefly, that as always, we're joined by Jared Mac Dr. Jared McIntasney, um, historian and author from Lurgan. Thank you very much. OK, so um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, thank you to Dolores, uh, to Gerard, to Gavin um, for inviting me to speak to everybody this evening. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the talk. So um, it's a fairly broad topic, um, the American Wake, and hopefully you'll have a, a good grip of what the American Wake is all about at the end of the, the presentation. I'll try and try to keep it within the hour if I can. I have no particular order on this. There's no particular story. So um I might be kind of jumping and jumping forward and back a little bit through, throughout the years. I've tried to kind of focus in around the Great Irish Famine, but obviously we, we, we referenced before it and afterwards up to kind of recent enough times where, where this tradition um, in a way has, has, still goes on. So I'll, um, I'll move on. You can look at the top right hand side of the, the slide there. We have a sculpture by uh, Kieran Tuhi. Who is, a, who is the residence uh, sculptor in um, the Irish Workhouse Centre in Pertumna. And this is his piece uh, called The American Wake. And, and that kind of expire, in, inspired me in my time in the, the workhouse in Pertumna. And we'll come across the transcription that inspired Kieran as well later on in the presentation. So I'll try and move on here. So I know we've mentioned the famine throughout the, the series and I'm not going to go back over um, too much of the what has already been, I suppose, um, covered. But just to give a little insight into where I come from, in a, I come from a place called Laura in County Tipperary. Now, I will be relying or have relied on um, the school's folklore collection. And for anybody who's not familiar with that, it can be found online and I'm sure we'll send out the link later on. Dukas.ie, so it was a folklore that was compiled by children in the 1930s. So their informants were often, you know, grandparents or elderly neighbours. So they were almost reaching right back to kind of memory, um, folk memory of the famine. And as, as you might have uh, heard in some of the previous talks, there is a kind of a, a collective silence around the famine, or definitely was. So this is, is a real insight. It's, it's, it's a hugely valuable uh, primary source. Um, and as you see, I'll refer to it um, a lot throughout the throughout the, the presentation. Dave, David, apologies for interrupting. Can I just mention that um, project, though you mentioned that it was a project in the Republic of Ireland. In the Republic yeah. of Ireland, yeah. That's just right. for especially for international audience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dolores. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to quote from, from one piece here. It says that the people say that the blight came on a Sunday night in July. It came across the country like a fog. On Monday morning, all the stalks were burned. The potatoes got black and decayed in the ground. Now, that's an amazing kind of piece of, of local folklore to say that the, the people or the old people could remember that, that particular night, that Sunday night in July, when the when literally the blight came to, to the, our part of the, the country. And I suppose it sparked the, the, the Great Famine and the immigration um, that, that, that kind of developed afterwards or, or spiralled afterwards. Another couple of uh, clippings here we have. At the time of the famine, this parish was thickly populated. They were evicted and they were starving on the roadside. All the people immigrated to America. Now, obviously, that's not true that they all immigrated to America. Many would have went to Canada and to, to um, Australia and, and to England. But it was almost seen that if somebody left, they were going to America. And I think that's the where the term American wake um, kind of came from. So regardless where you were going, where you left, if you were leaving, you had an American wake, which again, we'll, we'll cover in, in depth um, later on. And it also said that up to upwards of 40 families have recently left the parishes of Laura and Dora again for America. And that district will before long become um, completely deserted. 
So a book, um, a couple of books, I, I'll be touching on a couple of books, a couple of secondary sources that I, I, I used as well. Um, and one is Paddy's Lament by Thomas Gallagher, a wonderful, a wonderful book, um, great insight into, into Irish history, definitely around that time. And he says that Manny had never travelled more than 25 miles from where they were born or ridden in a fishing curragh, much less than an, op- an ocean going ship. They had been bound all their lives to the land, to one village and to one parish. That parish and its village represented the one place by which they knew and understood themselves and others. The one place whose skies, rocks, soil, woods, waters, roads, houses, church, burial ground and people that they knew better than their own hands. The one place they could never separate themselves in spirit, no matter where or how long they lived. Arthur Young and his travels in Ireland that was written um, between 1776 and 1779. He stated that Catholics never went. Of course, he's talking about immigration. They seem not only tied to the country, but almost to the parish they were born. So that, again, is backing up um, what Gallagher has, has just said in the last slide. Again, Gallagher says the farmers and cottiers have been worn by the priests, by travelling, by travellers returned from abroad, and by the Irish journals like The Nation against the extravagant stories of America told by agents who stood to profit by their going. No doubt the agents gave impetus and a certain brassy clamour to the exodus in 1847. But it was the famine, the whole complex of physical, emotional, social and family suffering it created that changed the attitude of the people towards leaving. From every parish, these escapees could be seen on their way to embark embarkation points with bags, bundles, boxes and chests, bedding, cooking utensils, utensils and sea stores of provisions for the voyage to the new world from which none would return. And we can see that piece of artwork um, here is from the. Wait, no, sorry, I just have to move my my bar from um, unknown artist from the Mary Evans Picture Library, um, and that shows this little Irish cottage. Again, we we probably have seen one of those, and the couple getting ready to to leave for the new world. So, an Irish wake. In older times, it was customary to keep a corpse in a house for at least two nights. All the friends and relatives of the deceased used to cry and lament. A member of the family always sat at the bedside to show respect for the dead and to cry with the sympathizers. This was called keening. A wake was held at night. Each individual who came to the wake was supplied with a pipe, tobacco and snuff. The neighbor, the neighboring boys and girls played all sorts of games. They used to play a game called slapping and another called spoil the market and a game called hort and another called Cora Stullian. Before going to the wake, all the young men took salt in their pockets for fear of a bad eye would be made at them and they would never go or return home. So this again is from the school's folklore collection from Ballygar in County Galway. So there's a few things going on there. We've got the, we're covering the keening. So this is the Irish wake we're talking about here, not the, the American wake. So this is a prelude to the American wake. So the Irish wake is, is obviously, as I said here, when somebody dies and this custom, even though Many will argue has died out. I mean, I've been at wakes now. Obviously, they've, they've, they've changed. Where people would sit up all night with with the with the corpse to pray. Um, if it's an older person and they've had a, lo- a long life, it becomes a kind of a celebration. There's obviously drink. There's a bit of laugh, and it, it it's almost like a party atmosphere. And the corpse is kind of center um, to the whole thing. And this can go on, you know, for for a couple of days, depending on on when the when the burial um, is organized. Um, another thing here that I'll refer to is the, the, the bad eye. So this is a part of this huge superstition, superstition that um, Irish people had, and maybe some even still have, um, that has that has only kind of died out in in, in kind of last generations. Um, and this bad eye or the evil eye, that there was a big fear of this evil eye. And there was a huge amount of superstition around this, even going back to kind of medieval times. So if Anton went wrong, somebody had to be blamed. So it was somebody bringing the bad eye or, you know, it had to be the fairies. So again, we see here that the, the young men are bringing salt in their pockets um, to, to keep them safe. And we again, we'll, we'll, we'll cover a few more of these traditions later on. David, can I ask you a question? Yes. The tradition, like you mentioned there about wakes and yes, and many parties, yet- the tradition of wakes has somewhat changed in certain parts of the island. Mm-hmm. Um, 
funeral homes will be more common in certain parts. But I know there in like I know where, where I am, where I live and where I'm from as well. Um, wakes are still very common. And uh, as you say, it's a wake's a few days long. Um, but the tradition at a, at a traditional wake, um, people sit up all night. Oh, they sit, they sit up all night. Yeah. 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 So a traditional wake, that's very common. Um, do you know where that comes from? Because when we say sit up all night, actually, people don't leave the corpse. The, like you know we you sit up all night and you keep uh, and it's only when kind of the light comes up do people actually then maybe would leave the room you know so do you know where that comes from yeah there's a lot there's a lot kind of written on it in different traditions and you know again what, whatever's happening in ireland and and is, is also kind of seems to be happening in scotland as well at the same time there's a huge overlap um but it's always kind of the same thing that they're sitting up all night with the with the with the with the um, corpse, and almost the way that they're protecting the corpse um, from being taken, or you know, there's and then there's other traditions about leaving the window open, or when the spirit has to leave, and there's if you're leaving awake that you you, you don't walk home in a straight line, that you will actually walk around in circles to confuse the the spirit of the corpse. So there's there's a huge amount. I mean, there's there's there's. Uh, that's a whole other lecture, but there's a, a huge um, tradition. Oh, the superstitions, I suppose, superstitions. and traditions. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. So again, we can see um, on the right hand side, uh, we, we were talking about keeners earlier on. So on the left hand side, we can see these old old ladies and they're keeners um, and they're crying. And sometimes they're professional criers or keeners um, kind of hired or they gather maybe for food or drink or whatever the, the case may be. And they'll cry at the, at the wake. So it's, it's a kind of a strange thing. I, it's something that I, I have never actually seen. That's one tradition that, that seems to have kind of died out with, with the, the more modern wakes that still survive. Um, and you can see in the right hand side here, we have a, a, an illustration of a, the Banshee. So she's probably the most famous keener of them all who, who would cry at night or tradition would say that if you hear um, the Banshee crying that certain families, she can predict their, their debt. So again, it's all tying into this kind of super superstition of the um, the wake surrounding with, with debt. And, you know, Irish people celebrated um, birth and, and debt and marriage. But as we'll see later on, in around the time period we're talking, the American wake has actually come into that um, as well. So I'm going to move on now to some kind of memories in the, in the landscape. So the Irish countryside, you know, it's it's dotted with with memories from the the famine. Some some have been forgotten. You know, there's there's some fields. As I said to, to to somebody one time, there's probably not a field in, in, in the countryside that there isn't there has there wasn't a, a famine story, that there wasn't a little cabin, or maybe somebody died in the field, or perhaps somebody is buried in the field. Um some of the memories are, are remain from maybe um the, the name of the field can actually be a, a kind of a link back to the time. But there are some, and you know, we'll probably get some more even from from um, our audience later on as well but as i as i go through i'll i'll just show you what i've kind of come across and i think one of the most famous memories of of that time is the bridge of tears in uh, dunfanaway in in county donegal and i'll just um recite a little piece here from Fitzgerald and, and lampert um from from their book on um, immigration in irish history so it says some of the convoy you know a convoy is is a, is the traveling people, the traveling convoy that followed the migrant, they might continue to the platform of the nearest railway station or the quayside of the port. The last look of the departing child at their parents and the home place made the most indelible impression of all. If there was a collective sense of trauma among immigrants and their descendants, it was aggravated from individual memories such as these. And there's a plaque there that, that is in Irish and that reads, family and friends of the person leaving, leaving for foreign lands would come this far. Here was the separation. This is the Bridge of Tears. So that was the tradition, and again, we'll touch on it after a while, where when the immigrant would leave home, the convoy, it's called, would follow the, the immigrant to a certain part of the landscape. You know, um, here we have the bridge. So this is obviously a, a, maybe a parish boundary or a townsend boundary. And some then might even continue on, as I said, to the railway station. And there was like this kind of series of goodbyes. And um, it was it was kind of heart wrenching for for these immigrants. I actually put that up on Facebook, the the, the Bridge of Tears a couple of years ago. I, I run a small Facebook page um, called Irish History Head. 
and um, I put it up and loads and loads of comments came back all over uh, from all over the world. And I just picked this one here. It was quite interesting from a lady in America who said, because my ancestors were from nearby Dunfanaway, it's likely they crossed this bridge on their journey to America. They should have stayed in Ireland because the only thing that awaited them here was poverty level work in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. In the winter, they never saw the sun because they entered the mine before sunrise and went home in the dark. Better to have starved in Ireland than have died of black lung in America. So I just found that a very interesting comment. And here we have an uh, abandoned house actually up in, um, I think it's 80s in County Donegal. We've got the Valley of Tears in Inishmore. Um, it is a stunningly beautiful and rugged cliff top area between Tour Martin and the Glasson Rocks. So named because many ships years ago, when the islanders took the immigration ship from Galway to the New World, the ships were up and sheltered here awaiting favourable uh, weather. One of the outcomes of this was that the islanders' relatives and family could go to the cliff top perch and could see, call out, beseech, but not touch or embrace their loved ones on board the American bound ship. This was a heartbreaking form of land to sea immigration wake, so close but yet so far. We also have the um, what's called the National Famine Way, and that starts in the National Famine Centre in Stokes, Strokestown in County Roscommon, and it leads the whole way up the um, the canal to, to to Dublin, where it, where it ends, and it commemorates the the, the missing one thousand four hundred and ninety people who were evicted from Strokestown um, in eighteen forty seven, and there's a series of bronze shoes. Um, let's say we can see one here on, on the left-hand side, follow the, the pathway that, that leads the whole way to Dublin. And this is a very simple one here. Some of you might have been on Chris Kniff's talk. Um, um, I think he spoke about the, the poor law re relief and, and, and the work that they had to do. This is just a little little spot on the banks of the Shannon in, in Clonfort, in Galway, where Christie's from, and he took this photograph for me. But traditionally, it's remembered, even though there's no marker or no plaque or nothing, that this is where people boarded their, their boats to go up the Shannon. They would then get on um, a, a barge onto the um, onto the canal and then make their way to, to Dublin, who possibly make their way to Liverpool and then make their way to, to America or wherever else. So, so this was the immigration point in Clonford and County Galway, just a simple little little. Um, suppose, as I said, it's just literally the side of the, the banks of the river with no marker to, to remember, it's just folk memory. And train stations, uh, something that we mightn't think about, a lot of the older train stations, I've picked one here that's not far from here, um, not far from me in Clock Jordan. I mean, if they could tell their stories, I mean, all the harrowing scenes, we can see this um, painting again. And there's lots and lots of artwork out there um, relating to immigration from Ireland. Here's one Irish immigrants waiting for a train in 1864 by er Ernst Erskine Nickel. Um, and again, we had all those scenes at the, at the train station. And again, that was probably the last goodbye. We spoke about the convoy, people going to the bridge, maybe coming to the town's land, maybe leaving them at home. And then some would come to the some to the, to the train stations. Here's another um, monument, a different type. Um, and it's Skibbereen. It's on the walls of the old workhouse in Skibbereen. And 110 orphan girls left Ireland for Australia under the Earl Grey scheme in the in the 1840s, and 4,114 all, altogether. And this is a little plaque to remember those on on the wall of the old workhouse. One closer to to um, to Armagh is in County Donegal or County Derry, and I only found this one recently, um, and it's the Immigration Cairn located on Cairn Toher mountain range and part of the Sperrin Mountains. And you can see it to the right hand side there, we have this cairn. So I suppose in, in, in Irish history, a cairn often is a place for remembrance or if there was somebody died or maybe somebody, you know, um, I know there's a couple in, in where I'm from where a priest was supposed to have been killed. There was a, um, a traditionally a cairn on the side of the road where all the travellers would leave a piece of stone um, but this one in particular is supposed to have been created by the immigrants on the way to Derry um, to, to get the boat to America. So they'd all leave a, a piece of stone. And um, I, I was in contact with um, a girl called Cathy O'Neill just yesterday. 
and she runs um, the Immigrant Walk um dot com so basically she has her walking group and she, she brings them up to this point and the, the views of it are meant to be spectacular and she also mentioned to me that um she um has a connection to freels and swatra i hope i'm pronouncing that right which on another note it was an old soup kitchen um where the rest David, yes swatra me? swatra <laughs> Swatra. Thanks. Swatra. Thanks, Lord. Swatra. <laughs> Swatra. So um, she was saying to me as well that they have their old, they have, um, their restaurant is on the site of the old soup kitchen that they're developing at the, at the moment. And, um, you know, as I read up on that, the owner of the, the Freels, you know, identified the fact that that whole story of the famine in mid mid Ulster needs to be told maybe a, a little bit better. So um, I was I was delighted to come across this, and I I, I hope to go up and, and take a, my own photographs. On the right hand side, just to join into that story, we have a um, kind of a statue here, a bronze statue of immigrants leaving Ireland through the port of Derry, which is obviously in Derry. But on the left hand side, a very similar one. In, in Scotland, and I mentioned that earlier on, that whatever was kind of happening in Scotland, the traditions and superstitions are in Ireland. A lot of these were were, were transferred or, or common in, in Scotland as well. And just on the topic of Cairns, I um, I, I read an article um, by Paul Bazou on um, basically Cairns in the landscape and kind of memories of immigrants. And they're quite common as well in, in Scotland. And... Uh, Definitely in the time of the um, the clearances, the major clearances in the highlands, that oftentimes after the people were gone, that they they would gather the stones of the abandoned cottages and make a cairn to remember the the, the immigrants. So that's just on a on a side note. This is just a, a literally a stone in the landscape, um, a place that Christy Kniff spoke about again, um, called the Schlevochtis. I remember, if you remember, we were speaking about the, the Ultox or the Ulster people who made their way down to the Schlevochtis in County Galway and Clare. And here's just a random stone just placed, and it, it it's it's kind of inscribed in Latin, but it remembers an MJ MJ Murray, um, who we believe is a is a, a priest, I think he's a father MJ Murray, who who you can see left for the USA in 1913. So again, he's just remembered in the in the landscape, and nobody to date can actually find anything on this man. But obviously, he did exist because his his name is written and remembered on this stone. And sometimes it can be as simple as a bunch of, of daffodils. Here on the right hand side, we have a man called Shane Conlon, who's a who's who I, I class as a friend of mine. He's from Australia. He came back to Ireland years ago to find his ancestral home. And he's from my, he's, his ancestors were from my parish, they were called Conlins. And we had very little to, to offer him. Um, we were looking up Griffith's valuation. That's, that was a, a, the, the closest um, source we had to maybe find the family name. And it was only by luck we were talking to a, an old, an old uh, farmer in around the area that where we thought this farm might be. And he said, oh, sure, I know exactly where the house is. And he said every year what we call Conlon's Field, he says a row of daffodils come up perfectly in a straight line. So the house is gone, but this perfect um, row of straight daffodils are actually um, the last thing that remembers the, 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 the house of Shane's ancestors. Here is, in my opinion, um, and I'm not taken away from the National uh, Famine Centre in Strokestown, which is, which is a wonderful place to visit, but a different experience or an outdoor experience or maybe, um, I suppose maybe something that's more raw is on Ackle Island, is the deserted famine village on Ackle. Um, I only visited there last, I think, October. And I could have stayed there for hours and hours. Um, I really got an insight. If, if anybody is listening or traveling over to Ireland at some stage, <clears throat> if you want to get a feel for the Irish famine, this is the place to get it. Um, you can see in the landscape how the people survived, I suppose, pre-famine. They have the loads and loads of houses, or as Christy called, clahans, um, these little kind of communities of stone houses built together. You can see it's overlooking the, the Atlantic there. And... Here we have the potato ridges. Again, they're, they're a real memory in the landscape. And as Christy mentioned, these are more than likely not dug out. So you can see on this, on this landscape, there's fresh water running down the hill. There's the potato beds or the potato ridges. They have stone for building their houses. They have bog land in front here to, to keep themselves warm with, with burning turf for peat. So they literally were self-sufficient on the, on the island here or on the on Ackle. Um, 
obviously until the potato famine um, came. But it's a real, it's it's a very, very poignant site. I, I have to say, I can't stress that enough. And the only plaque in my, our monument really that's left is this one that says, this then is what a human habitation looks like when it has been left in peace after death. So the Fastnet Rock, south just south of Cork, at the at this most southern tip of Ireland, and it's known as Ireland's teardrop. The Fastnet Rock, with its lighthouse, is Ireland's last lonely outpost in the Atlantic. The great ocean liners and the tramp steamers, which which hug our southern shores on the way to North America and Canadian ports, only say goodbye to Ireland and to Europe when the Fastnet light sinks, winking under the horizon. It is the last glimpse of era seen by many poor Irish immigrants, and it is the first welcoming beam which greets many of them when or if they return once more to their native land. And this is just a, an, another one, I suppose, a more modern, modern one of a stained glass window um, in Erie's church in, in West Cork. I just took a picture of it. First of all, I love the, the colours, but it just tells the story of, of immigration. Um, and I think the second from the top there is St. Brendan on, on his um, navigation to, to America. And we see the coffin ships on top and we see what is more than likely a, um, an Aer Lingus plane at the bottom, which tells its own stories, possibly from the 1980s. And I think the wild geese are represented in there as well. So immigration, you know, didn't didn't stop in Ireland um, in around the, the famine period. It continued and it, it continues today. So we'll talk a bit about the American Wake. So again, we have a close up here of Kieran Tuhi's piece on the American Wake. So it says when a person was going to America, a dance was held in that person's house the night before he went. All the neighbours were invited. Towards morning, a few old women usually started lamenting and wailing. These would be the keeners. This dance was called an American Wake. The American Wake is 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 um, most the most common term, but it's all it's most common uh, commonly known in Ulster as convoy a live wake in the Golden Vale of Tipperary and, and Limerick and Cork, the farewell supper or feast of departure in Connacht, the bottle night or bottle drink in Donegal, parting spree or just a spree in the southeast and the pale um, counties. So you're talking Leinster, Dublin and south of Leinster. So all, all these together are commonly known as the American wake. So I'm going to read out this one now, if you can bear with me. And it's from, again, from Paddy's Lament. And this is the piece which inspired Kieran Tuhi to create that wonderful uh, sculpture on the top left. At last, with the kindness of efficiency, the drained and exhausted son tried to leave, embracing his father, kissing his mother, making quick, solemn promises to take care of himself and send back money. He turned as if expecting his mother to release him. The father, too, his pent-up sorrow killing him, tried to shorten the ordeal. But the mother, with her instinct for the truth of the situation, must have no part of it. She knew that when she she would never see, be with, talk or listen to her son again, that once she released him from her grasp, he would be as good as dead as far as the rest of her life was concerned. All the untouched time between her and her son, all of it still to be lived, would now and forever be lived in separation. The son knew what she was going through, her naked grief tore his heart. And to end it once and for all, he used his utmost strength and his father's help to free himself. With tears streaming down his face, he turned and ran out, waved goodbye to the remaining guests and joined the convoy of youths chosen to accompany him to the port or to the next town on the way to the port. But as often happened, the mother at the very end broke free of her husband's grasp and with a deafening wail, ran out of the cottage to lock her arms once more around her son. She clung, she hugged, she sobbed, her concern for appearance completely deserting her. Her tears and swollen eyes and the agony in her voice cried out, Oh, Tommy, don't go. For the son, it was a ghastly experience, one that the other young men in the audience swore they would at any cost avoid. Many of them, in fact, did by stealing off to America without their parents' knowledge. And that's a, an extremely emotional piece. And you can see why Kieran was, was so touched by it. And there's an awful lot going on in, in, in that. Um, and that's what was experienced in, in thousands of households all over Ireland. Because in the, I suppose, mid 19th century, and we're talking around the, the famine time, once you left Ireland, the chances were very, very slim that you would return. And that's why it was called awake, because it was literally that that child was was dead that that child would never be seen again 
And there was all, so- all sorts of kind of psychological trauma that went with this, you know, from the parents to the child having to go from the other, as it said here, the other men watching this um, experience happen. Um, and there's a term I've, I've come across in my research called an Irish leave, um, which says basically that it's to leave unannounced. And anyone that knows anybody from Ireland, um, there's always 100 goodbyes when they're going, even if you're you're saying goodbye on the phone, there's about 10 goodbyes. So I just wonder if this this tradition of this Irish leave, which seems to have come from America, go dates back. It's only a theory that it possibly dates back to these guys who actually chose to go to America without their parents' knowledge and just left under the kind of shadow of darkness. Here we have another piece of art. Um, it's, it's just called Irish Immigrants Leaving Home from Har- Harper's Bazaar from 1870. But again, quite applicable back to the famine times. And you can see the priest kind of middle of center there. And he's um, blessing one of the one of the immigrants going. And the bottom left there, there seems to be children kind of crying and comforting with the, the family pets. And we have the keeners, what, what appears to be on the left hand side. And the men then are helping kind of um, stack all the belongings onto the, the cart. So the spree was the equivalent of the American wake. The night before a son or daughter immigrated was usually devoted to dancing and merrymaking. Dance was given as a send off. And though the sorrow of parting was felt, it was never allowed to mar the merriment of the occasion. The practice was a natural extension of Ireland's reverence for the dead or waking, watching over the dead person during the night prior to, to burial or to prevent evil spirits from entering the body. Since departure was a kind of debt, especially when a voyage across the ocean to America could last two to three months and the prospect of return was beyond imagining. The immigration ceremony was associated with waking the dead. Birth, marriage, death and burial were the foremost important events in Ireland's peasant society. The American wake would be the fifth, even if it took on the element of all four. So another um, clip here from the Dublin Weekly Nation in in, um, May 22nd 1875 speaks about literally the the line of immigrants that are are lining up to 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 leave um county clare and it says the american wakes as they are convenient conventionally called as a rule proceed the night before those leave taking which of course are occasioned by the state of peace and prosperity that exists throughout the land thus are the ties of kindred rudely severed And another piece here about the American Wake, it says it was an old custom to have what they called the Great Spree on the eve of all um, departing to America. At this, all the friends and relatives were. They ate and drank, sang and danced and played during the night. Sometime near the morning, the parents, especially the mother of the boy or girl who was going to America, set up a terrible cry. Sorry, now I just have to move the bar. Then the relatives joined and afterwards the friends. Then there was a terrible chorus of cries which lasted well over an hour. This usually occurred a couple of hours before daybreak. Then all the guests went to all the guests went to the station with the person who was leaving. The train was due at eight o'clock. Sometimes the young girls or boys would be leaving the station. A terrible cry would be set up by all. This happened in the case of Patrick Owens, was a local favourite. And this is a story from Kyle Moore in County Roscommon. Long ago, when a person was going away to America, he gave a dance to his friends the night before. That dance was called American and American Wake. The following day, a person was leaving for the train. About 10, 10 horse car loads would go to the trail station, train station in procession. These cars were called an American funeral. So that's a different take on it um, from County Kerry. And a quote from Kirby Ann Miller in her book, um, it's one of the books that I, 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 I refer to throughout again in Immigrants, called Immigrants and Exiles. And she states, it made very little difference between going to America or going to the grave. It was as if you were going out to be buried. By the late 19th century, it was customary for the Yankee, the immigrant, to make a confession and to take communion on the Sunday before departing and also pay an obligatory visit to the parish priest's house. There receiving his blessings, presents of prayer books, scapulars and holy pictures and medals, as well as much excellent advice to the dangers to faith and morals to be met with by those who leave the Catholic atmosphere of Holy Ireland. Thus an old woman recalled that at a bottle drink in Donegal, 
a father turned to his son and said, get up here, son, and face me for a step, for it is likely it will be the last step <clears throat> we will ever dance. At that, she remembered there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Now, these American wakes could be um, lively affairs, and sometimes um, they got a little bit out of hand. We have a couple, I won't read all these now, but we have a couple of um, newspaper clippings 1887, 1895, 1909, and 1897. And literally, there was, they're, they're all kind of accidents and maybe in assaults that, that happened after these American wakes, there was a fatality on a, on a Kerry railway where one man was coming home from American an American wake and he was the immigrant himself. So he, he was killed by the train. So obviously there was a lot of drink at these um, parties and um, afterwards there, there, there could be a, a kind of a negative fallout. Here's um, a kind of a, a, a peculiar extracts that I found in the Irish News and Belfast Morning News from the 22nd of July 1907 and again I won't read the whole thing out but it's the story it's a story by Father um, Guinan and he speaks about um, he speaks about the the struggle for bread the American way well, no just the, the different oh yeah so Roddy Carroll so basically the story is about Roddy Carroll and he ha all his children and they have an American wake and there's there's tears and again, all the all the steps that we covered already, um, as we mentioned, and all that kind of psychological kind of torment. And the first daughter leaves to America and she's not long settled when she sends back a letter and what's called remittance. So basically money or a ticket for the next child um, to go. And it mentions that the first bird has flown the nest of, of Roddy Carroll's house and eventually they're all gone bar one. So it was it would have been kind of common that the older son or would stay if there was a farm and the older son might stay and farm the farm. And maybe the oldest daughter or maybe the youngest daughter would stay and look after the parents. But we can roll on after literally all the children are gone. It rolls on to 17 years later. It says, thus if the family of Roddy Carroll, um, the first were scattered on the waves of the world, his house was not des destined to become extinct in the old land. Like the phoenix arising from her ashes, the house of a Carroll has sprung into life again. An instinct, um, instinct with the youthful vigor of former days. The old home nest is occupied by a new brood. I and the wings of some are ready, are already stirring impatiently for the flight across the seas. So basically, what it's saying here is that his his child has now had has had their own children, and those grandchildren now of Roddy Curl are now getting ready to to set sail across the the, the seas. So these are some uh, traditions I came across. Relating to the to the immigrant, and America was known as the the land to the west, and the the west uh, is kind of steeped in tradition in in kind of Irish history. And the west was the the place of fabled islands and a symbol of death and departure, as in the west rooms reser were reserved and um, for the aged parents who give up the farm. And the west as the west room is believed or said was closer to the grave. Tiernan Og was where the westward travellers left and never returned, only to wither and die. And these signs are are, are down in, in, in West Cork. I just um, added them for a little bit of interest. So some of the food that um, people would have brought with them, it was mentioned earlier on that they would bring the provisions with them. And one of the, the strangest ones I came across was frog bread, which was believed to protect the immigrant from fever. It was made by roasting and pulverizing a frog with the resulting powder mixed into the bread dough. Guests who could not afford a gift for the Im immigrant would offer um, words of advice and traditional blessings. So just going back to the frog bread, that was something I'd never come across before. So I did a bit of research on that and I actually came across, um, I was intrigued by the fact that they believed that it might kind of help with um, with problems in the, in the stomach or, or help um, kind of fight fever. Um, when I came across this newspaper clipping from 1973 from Offaly, and it said that the practice of swallowing live frogs was quite common in Ballycumber area, and there are still a few old timers who swear by the frog as an unfailing remedy for those gastric disorders which defy the best treatment which doctor or chemist can provide. So that's um, that's a new one on a, on a lot of us, I would imagine. And we have, of course, the, the traditional baked bread on the left hand side here and the reason i have the picture here is the cross 
And I would I would have only recently discovered that, that that cross was purposely put into the bread to keep the fairies away from the bread. So again, going back to the to the superstition um, that Irish people had, another food they would have brought was a type of boiled egg, and they had a way of kind of fermenting the egg. Um, I've never tried it, and I don't think I I I, I would want to. But they had a, a particular way that the eggs would last um, a long time. Let's say for through throughout their journey. Another extract here. Sorry, I'm Sorry, intrigued. Have you any idea how they preserve these eggs? I read up on this and the closest I could come was some sort of a Chinese uh, recipe for doing it, that they, they managed to slowly boil the egg for literally hours. Um, don't ask me what kind of chemical reaction happened that they could actually preserve the egg because you do find references to them bringing eggs with them. So you can imagine leaving home and even by the time you'd, you'd, you'd make, let's say if you're in the centre of Ireland and, and, and you make the make it to the boat um, with your eggs, you'd imagine they'd be kind of gone off. So I really don't know. Maybe someone else would be able to kind of um, add to that one. But I wouldn't like to be sitting beside the, the passenger who, who cracked open his egg halfway across the Atlantic. <laughs> so till quite, till quite lately, <clears throat> there was a feature of life around the district of Mullah. On the eve of an immigration of a boy or a girl or a little company of boys and girls, a wake was held at the home of one of these. This was usually a subscription party. That is, all the neighbours contributed money and heaps of drink, meat, tea and all kinds of sweet things were promised. Musicians who had the best name in the countryside were provided and about eight o'clock a dance was in full, full progress, usually in the barn. The dance was kept up till morning. Songs were plentiful during the night from the immigrants and the well-wishers. All would be in tears at, at, at some such song as it was heard. If a fortune I make when far over the sea, then I'll come back, my own darling mother, to thee. At the time of slow and expensive travel, very few returned, and the darling mother would usually be dead when they did. So again, music would have been a big part of these American wakes and song, and I've, I've come across kind of even songs being written um, and again, just edging back to the famine, during the famine, obviously, there wasn't heaps of drink and tea and stuff being, and sweet things being brought to the immigrants. So it probably was words of advice or maybe holy relics. And I've come across references to where people might even write a song about the about the immigrant on that night. Um, and there are literally, literally hundreds and hundreds of these immigrant songs scattered throughout um, the school's folklore record. I came across this book on the left hand side called Irish Immigrant Songs and Ballads. And we all know them. I mean, if it's not come back, Paddy Riley to Bally James Duff and even the, the Pogues saying about thousands are sailing. These are all recent enough ones, but they go right back. And there's literally, literally hundreds of them. Um, University College Cork even have a, a website dedicated to um, um, all, the, all the, the songs that they could, could kind of come across as well. And here's just two. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sing them. I'll just say out the lines of 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 two of them that I came across. Um, good goodbye, goodbye, my dear old friends. From you, I never hear. But when you read these simple lines, you will hold my memory dear. I think of you wherever I be until death may lay me low. Goodbye, goodbye, old Nathan Hill, and God be with Mayo. Another one here from County Tipperary. Soon I'll be speeding onwards in a train from Bancha Town and passing on by Barnlock. A window I let down to take a look, a last fond look of the place that well I know for the fairest, dearest spot on earth is the Glen of Arlow. So every single county, almost nearly every every single parish, I think has has one of these songs or poems. There's actually a huge, huge amount. When I started kind of looking into them first, I thought I'd I'd, I'd try it naively gather them all, but I mean, there's just so many out there. But it just goes to show that these were a huge part of the these um, American wakes. Another tradition, and some of these are, are quite curious. Um, long ago, when people were going to America, they went on an old, they went to an old man who was supposed to have a charm. They brought him tobacco or money and also a cord. The man then made a knot with the cord, saying some words all the while. The person then put the end around his wrist, and it was supposed to keep him from getting drowned during the voyage. If it went, if he went wrong saying the words, the person was supposed to get drowned. So that's from my lock in County Galway. It was also common for people to bring a bottle of clay or some touch from their home 
and oftentimes the immigrants were actually buried um, with, with these. Monaster Boys High Cross. This is the tallest high cross in Ireland, standing at seven metres high. It is said that at the time of the Great Famine, locals would chip off a piece of the cross before immigrating. Some parts have been badly eroded and are difficult to interpret, but scenes from both the Old and New Testaments have been identified. And you can see in the picture there at the bottom of the, the base of the cross where literally lumps of the cross have been taken off. So again, this was something, a tradition that I suppose they felt safe that they were bringing part of this Holy Cross with them across the sea. I don't know if I'm saying this one right. You might correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but St. Moog, um, the clay of St. Moog, which can be collected inside the ruins of the old church on the island, is said to be an insurance against fire or drowning. It features in the story of the Titanic um, disaster when Mary McGovern of Corlock attributed her, risk, her rescue to the St. Moog's clay that she carried on her person. And there is um, Mary McGovern who survived the sinking on the Titanic. Also, um, prayers to Colum Kill, St. Colum Kill were, were quite common um, as he was seen to be a kind of one of the first immigrants as he was exiled to, to, to Scotland. And again, as I mentioned, the Cairns earlier on in Scotland, um, one of these um, was, was erected or unveiled, I think, um, at, at what is called an immigrant's farewell on St. Columba's Day or St. Columb's Day in 1838. So the ritual of leave-taking began with the intending immigrant making a round of final visits to the home of neighbours. The bounds of the family farm or townland might also be walked, as it were, taking a mental photograph of the home place. So this was quite important. I mean, think about it. They didn't have, you know, photography. Um, they had no photograph. Once they left, that was it. Um, and they would take a, literally have a mental photograph of their parents, of their family, of their land, of their home. And we'll touch on that again later on. And also uh, I've come across where these young people, the, the parents took a mental photograph of, of them. So they were kind of forever young, almost as if they had, again, they had died. So this was a kind of a tradition before they left to try and take everything in. Then with appropriate permission, immigrants were released from their current domestic and communal obligations, but on the unspoken tradition that they were effectively renouncing any claim to the family farm. So obviously this was for the for the sons or the second son or maybe the third son, because normally one was left at home. So effectively, once you left, that was it. You were, you were giving up your right to ever come back to take the farm back. Normally, it was not expected that they would return home to make such a claim. At the same time, they were required to undertake a new set of obligations by promising to write home frequently, send money, as we mentioned earlier on, including remittance um, regularly and paradoxically to return home eventually, even though the chances of that were, were quite slim. So this is just um, a short film I came across and I'm just going to run through it briefly. And what this actually does, it's a film by Kevin Quinn. It's a very short film, probably only about 15 minutes long, and it's on YouTube. And again, this is from my public history hat. It was a great way to kind of take it in in a, in a different form. Um, and it's about a young girl who basically gets a letter um, from America from her, her older sister who has sent a remittance home. And you can see the father reading the letter here. And it's a very strange kind of film. And the father almost resents her going but doesn't stop her going. And then she's kind of tormented, you know, thinking about going. She has a little brother there, you can see on the right hand side, who she's very close to. And the whole kind of film runs through this kind of mental torment that, that she's suffering. Um, you can see it here. And she talks to the little fella in the bed again, because she knows once she goes, um, that's it. She, she's not coming back and she probably won't see. She doesn't seem to have a great relationship with her father, but she's very close to her brother. So um, it just kind of really kind of brings it home on screen. It's a little image of the little fella as she's leaving and the parents watching the, the ship, um, as we mentioned earlier on, on the, on the cliffs of Inish, Inish Moor. Um, quite similar scene here. And literally they're, they're digging potatoes and she's gone and then they turn around and go back to their work. And later on in, in the film, she does return home. Um, this is her going across holding her, her holy medals. She does return home and you can see Obviously, the little boy, has, he's not there. Actually, the little boy has, has died. She, she comes home for his funeral. She hasn't seen him since. But this just kind of captures what I was mentioning earlier on. She has this mental picture. He was forever young in her eyes.
And here she is as, as an old woman after returning home. So we're coming to, to the close. Um, I'll try and skip through this. I, I said I'd, 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 I'd keep it to the hour. Here we have that uh, wonderful statue of Annie Moore in, in Cove and her little brothers. And there's obviously the, the her counterpart statue in Ellis Island in uh, New York. And another um, statue, as you can see, I like taking pictures of, of statues and memorials. This is the Spirit of Love in um, Bantry Bay in County Cork. And it remembers basically those who were lost at sea. So the agent, the exodus by now, um, being discussed in all the newspapers and in every village corner, there were signs everywhere of panic and hysteria, of opportuni opportunistic greed, that even in the midst of the famine deeds on both, um, shipping uh, agents fanned out over the whole countryside, extolling the safety and spaciousness of the ships whose tween decks they intended to jam with immigrants, a cargo much more profitable to the shipping companies than crates and bales. No matter its age or tonnage, a vessel was always first class, replete with su superior accommodations, fast and expressively built for the passenger trade or uh, admirably adapted. At every chapel gate, they posted flaming placards to be read by parishioners on Sundays, giving sailing dates, em embarkation points and destinations as though not a minute were to be lost by anyone considering immigration, that only fools were left remaining in Ireland. So there was a panic almost set into people, you know, at the fault of these agents. Um, here I just have one, a clipping from a, a newspaper in, from Potomna, which is close to me again, um, giving free, literally advertising free passage to Australia as they were looking for, for, for workers. Um, and there was all sorts of kind of propaganda about this. And again, as we heard earlier on that the priests and the journals like the nation were warning against it. But it seemed to be not only the famine driving people out, but there was this pull um, to America and to Australia and to, to Canada. And a lot, a lot kind of left um, on these ships that were, would become called famine ships or coffin ships. Um, and again, the, on the left hand side here, it it. it it calls these the ship a fine ship. So they think that they're getting on these kind of, you know, comfortable fine ships that they're going to have a comfortable sailing across the, the Atlantic, which we know wasn't the wasn't the case. Canal travel as well. So when we look at the the, the Midlands, a lot of people made their way to to um to Dublin and to the ports by canal. <clears throat> and here it says that the journey from Mullingar to Dublin took about 13 hours in the early stages of the canal service. But by the 1840s, faster boats known as fly boats had cut journey times to eight hours. Um, and it, But these were also overloaded in, in famine times. And it says in 1845, six passengers died when a boat capsized in Longford Harbour. Some immigrants would have travelled by Grand Canal um, which was in which was in we had the Royal and the the the, the Grand Canal and making the way to to Dublin. It says also from the folklore records that two or three from every house went to America from the village <clears throat> long ago, according to the size of the family. Most of them young girls. The eldest girl would pay the passage money for all the rest of the family. The people at home got a lot of money from America. So again, this is just kind of backing up what we see throughout this kind of remittance that's been sent home. One will go and then the next and, and so on. But many st died of starvation while others were shipped um, to America on vessels described as ocean hearses. Many died from fever on the voyage and found coffinless graves in the Atlantic. Thousands of others were thrown on the American shores as it was a common sight to see cartloads of dead bodies thrown into a big hole without a coffin or shroud. Millions of pounds was given by the English government to carry out the eviction scheme and thousands of Irish Catholics were transferred to Canada. So I'll briefly touch on the, the Brig St. John and, and the Hannah. <clears throat> and if I'm correct here, I think the Hannah left Newry um, for Quebec in 1846. Seven in the in the height of the 1849, and the Hannah was um, the Hannah was captained by a, a master Curry Shaw, and basically it it made its way across the, across the Atlantic, um, and it hit an iceberg similar to the Titanic, 
And the, the captain and his, his basically two of his companions left on the only, the records say the only life boat that was on the boat. So again, this goes to show you that how how, how well kind of safety was, was, was thought about on these ships. So he left and left everybody behind, including uh, a lot of his crew who actually managed to help a lot of the passengers onto um, ice icebergs. So it, it was a horrendous story where like the whole families literally died. Um, one man, John Murphy, he left his twin boys on the ice to search for his infant daughter. And miraculously, he found her. Um, she had survived after being immersed in, in the frigid or cold water. And sadly, the ice holding his boys had drifted away. So these harrowing stories. The Hannah was, was something similar. It almost made its way to, to Cohasset in, in uh, Massachusetts when it, when it was broke up on rocks. And again, there's a, there's a great book um, on this actually by William Henry from County Galway. And he speaks about this, that the Hannah, he, he, he states, was overloaded. And again, we have a, a piece of um, bog oak sculpture by Kieran Tuhi on the right hand side. And this shows people down being used as basalt, uh, basalt. So that they're being used as the as the, the weight, basically, to, to, to balance the ship that um, he was overloading the ship, that he was literally making unofficial stops down the West Coast and overloading the ship. So when the ship went down, that um, he literally um, tried to escape himself and he, he said that there was no survivors, where clearly people on the, the mainland could actually see Irish people um, trying to cling on to, to pieces of the, the wreckage and, and, and to survive. So these are just two of numerous ships that went down. Um, and again, we haven't even touched on the disease and the fever, uh, you know, and the, 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 the likes of the immigration. When, when they made it to the likes of Canada, let's say Gross Eel, um, when they, when they had to be quarantined in these quarantine stations. And again, horrific stories. So the, the journeys um, across the Atlantic, especially in the famine time, were, were, were horrific. I'm going to just touch on, um, I suppose we mentioned the, the Titanic earlier on, and again, it's tied into the whole immigration. But on the when we're on the, the line of tragedies, when the Titanic went down, uh, one of the saddest, uh, two of the saddest stories relating to Ireland is, I suppose, the Rice family on the right-hand side, where you had the, the, the mother and her five children. They all drowned um, off the Titanic. Um, they were from Athlone. And then you had the Ather Ghoul, um, 14, from North Mayo, and there's a memorial garden to 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 them, even though three survived, but 11 of them um, perished on the Titanic. So you can imagine the the kind of scene of, the, again, the American wake the night before of the, these 14 young people leaving um, Mayo and um, then the news breaking that the Titanic had, had sank and um, only three of them survived. So just a, a, a quick one on the Titanic. There was 1,385 bags of letters destined for America that went down the, on Titanic. So how many of these letters were, were, were being sent over to um, to immigrants who had who had left? So, I mean, this was the communication over and back, all these letters, all these remittance sent back over and back. And again, the Titanic, as we know, was was full of Irish immigrants. We're, we're coming to the, to the end now. Um, in this painting, it shows the interior of a West Cork cottage. The young girl reads a letter received from America to her parents, who are presumably Ill Ill illiterate. The girl, therefore, can be read as representing the spread of universal education in Ireland in the mid-19th century, with the establish establishment of the government national school system. Her parents are dependent on the daughter's newly acquired skills. It is difficult to overemphasize over the importance of universal liter literacy in relation to political and social developments in Ireland in the 19th century. So this was a huge thing. I mean, we spoke about letters over and back, but if the immigrant couldn't write or if the parents couldn't read, the, the you know, that was going to break down. So oftentimes the immigrants had to, had to get someone else in America, we'll, we'll say, for example, to write back on their behalf um, or else educate themselves over in, in the States or America or Canada or Australia, or wherever they ended up. And likewise, this this um, government national school system, when, when children were being um, educated and they could read, that kind of was a, was a big game changer um, for, for Irish families. So at least um, they were able to re read the letters that were coming home. So I'm going to finish up just on a couple of personal stories. And this is quite personal to me. Now we're jumping right up into the 1930s and this is my grand aunt Delia Carl and my family came from County Galway we ended up in Tipperary because she married in Tipperary um, 
when I remember her, we lived with her, you know, she, she in, the, in the same house up to the 1990s when she passed away. And she was a cross lady. Um, and she sat in a chair beside the fire and she prayed all day. But every so often she'd tell me stories about America. And I was quite young at the time, probably 10 or 12, and had no major, major interest in it. And I wish I could have her back for, for, for a chat again. Um, but after she died, we discovered this kind of box of... of keepsakes she had and in that was all these kind of pieces that she kept from her trip to America she went to America in 1935 and you can see the the menu here from the Samara as she was traveling um, on Independence Day and they had a celebration dinner so she went to America to become an au pair one of these women who became known as the Bridgets who, who made it um, to America to be au pairs and Going, reading through these letters, she, she worked in this house in um, Bronxville in, in, in um, New York. And this house was sold for over a million dollars in only the last couple of years. And by the power of the internet, I was actually able to make contact with um, one of the, the little girls who, who was mentioned in this letter. This letter is from 1939, I think. And it mentions a little girl called Peyton. Um, and she's still alive. And, and I remember tracking her down through the power of Facebook and just telling her I had these amazing letters um, from their all pair. And it was amazing just to, to, to make contact um, and to contact with her. But my aunt, Delia, um, had to come home. And if anyone has ever seen that film, Brooklyn, uh, Saoirse Rohan plays the, the lead role. And again, we talk about that 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 um, guilt, that psychological torment of leaving the, the parents behind, behind. In that, her case, she left her mother behind. But my Aunt Delia was the opposite. She had to come home. She had to come home to, to mind her father. And I think she was very, very happy in, in America. And that's why she kept all these things, including this picture of this handsome gentleman with his big moustache, um, who, who writes to her and tells her to come back to America and says that basically that her brother needs to find a wife and the wife can look after her father. And then he also advises her to not change her poons or, or not change her dollars into Irish poons or English pounds, but to change it to gold because the world war is about to start. So there's huge information in, in these letters. And she, she, this is just a kind of a snippet of all the stuff she kept in her, her travel box. And I, it made me sad actually reading all these uh, kind of letters because I really do think her life was supposed to be in America, not back in Ireland. When she came back to Ireland, I think she got married, possibly an arranged marriage, age 40. She had a little uh, girl who passed away called Mary, who was only two years old. Hence, my father was a second son in a county, on a Galway, County Galway farm, and he um ended up going out to to um live with her and i suppose work on that family farm and that's how we ended up in Tipperary. but i remember him having bad days as well <clears throat> working the farm and maybe not making money and saying he should have went over to his cousins in in boston so um there was you know it was immigration all all through their family and every family in ireland um had it and, and has it and this is a peculiar one. I was I was telling a, a friend of mine about my my talk. I gave this talk, as I mentioned to Dolores earlier on. I gave it um, during COVID, and I was I was I love talking to people and I love drawing out kind of stories. And it's amazing what stories people have. But this man told me about a story about his aunt called Nell Burns, who was born in 1900 and left for America in the 1920s. Like that, she had her American wake and she took her kind of mental photographs of leaving home and she loved Ireland. She loved home and she loved the old farm and she loved the way of the the way of, of life, I suppose. But she came home in the 1960s and I just put in a little picture of an Aer Lingus plane there just for, for visual. But when she came home she, and she landed in the home farm, it had all changed. The, her home house was now a shed. I think there was um, cattle in it or chickens or something in it. Her brother had taken over the farm. Everything had changed. All the people she knew and she remembered had changed or gone. And she last, she was due home in Ireland for two weeks for holiday. She lasted one day. She turned around and went back to America, never to come home again. So again, no different than the, the immigrant back in the, in the famine times, taking that snapshot of when they left, these people um, would never change in their mind. Likewise, when the immigrant left, they were kind of frozen in time in the in their mind, but right up until um, what we can class as as as, as recent times. So it, here's a very interesting one. Um, it was an old Irish custom 
that if you were the last to immigrate from your family home, you should carry an ember from the family heart and place it in the care of a neighbor's fire to burn it until the day you might return. There was a case in County Mayo, the Mayo man reluctant to leave his, leave his home for he had four fires burning in his fireplace awaiting the owner's return. So we probably heard the, the term keep the home fires burning. But this, again, was probably a psychological thing that they would come back. So don't let the fire go out. You know, we'll give it to a neighbor for when we come back. And deep in their hearts, they probably knew that they would never come back. So just to finish, I have a, um, an extract from Pat Morrigan's um, song, Thousands Are Sailing. You brave Irish people, wherever you go, I pray, stand a moment and listen to me. Your sons and fair daughters are going far away and thousands are sailing to America. Eh? The night before leaving, they bid their neighbours goodbye and early next morning, their hearts give a sigh. They will kiss their fond mothers and those words they will say, goodbye, darling parents, we are going far away. The end. And the case you'll see there belonged to my um, grand aunt Delia that she brought all the way over to America and all the way back again. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody for listening. I think yeah. um, uh, in terms of, of wakes, uh, a very good example or description of it's given in uh, William Clarton's work, um, Traits and Tales, I think it's of the Irish peasantry, early 19th century, where he describes in detail the crack that went on at wakes. And he gives one example of where the boys at the wake had rigged up a set of bagpipes to the corpse so when the uh, priest walked into the room, he walked on the bagpipes with screeched all over the place and the corpse jumped up in the bed and terrified him, you know. So um, that gave an idea of what was going on um, in, the, your... in the wakes. Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned the um, the professor from the London Metropolitan Archives there um, who was looking in whatever. And the, probably the best collection, in fact, the voluminous collection of papers relating to the first famine of the first major famine of the 19th century, the 1822 famine, is hailed by the London Metropolitan Archives. A huge amount of material on about 14 counties, mainly west from Donegal right down to uh, Cork, also parts of uh, Tyrone and Derry um, in Ulster. But a huge, massive amount of material which hasn't been used um, at all. It hasn't been mined, so massive material there in the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, in relation to the emigration uh, during the famine, I mean, it becomes commonplace from 1848-49 onwards. The newspapers are full of ads advertising for all types of uh, mechanics and farmers and saying how much land they could have and everything when they head over to America. Uh, and then you find from the late 1840s and the 1850s then, with the amount of poor rate uh, unceasing, the amount of cess still there, the, the uh, rents being owed, that there's a huge Huge level of petitions from um, the land of the state paper. So it was mentioned there uh, around the Swatra, the, the South Derry area, um, which was under the control of the London companies. And there's a significant amount of petitions there. And it's, it's interesting to note that uh, it's mainly uh, women and children who are asking for funding from the, the landlords so that they can go out and uh, be with their husbands who have already gone out before them. And you do find occasional references in the workhouse registers, um, or the workhouse minute books rather, to requests from uh, women and children uh, in the workhouse to be paid their way out to the to the uh, to America to where their husbands have been beforehand. So obviously it was a, they went out on a, as a trial to see how it worked out and then um, either sent back money or if they're in the workhouse, then asked for the uh, the wife and children to, to be sent out. And one of the best sources, and I actually some of the stuff is heart-wrenching, it's in it, um, are the ads that have been um, ploughed through by Ruth Ann Harris for the, the Boston pilot. Um, and you find m hundreds and hundreds of ads in that paper where people are landing um, and looking for fathers, brothers, sisters, mothers who've been some weeks or months beforehand. In some cases, you'll find where children have gone out maybe 12, 13, and they can speak Irish only, and a brother or sister is searching for them. So really, really good material there. you know. So, But the thing that strikes you about as the famine progresses is that movement to America just becomes commonplace. It's 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 standard stuff. And actually, uh, David mentioned there about the uh, the remittances being sent back. Of course, a term that's still used to this day, if you get easy money and everything, is it's money from America. You know, it's obviously obviously come, stems from then. You know, so that's just a number of points that I wanted to make. Uh, and that the concept of remittance is still exists today for immigrant communities sending money home. Mm -hmm. So it's very common. Um, 
So just looking through my notes here. Apologies. Just um, I just you remi- sorry. Sorry, sorry, no, just sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you do. You see it today, Western Union. And you'll see immigrants who have come over here and they're, they're sending money back home. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And just you were talking about a family relative and um, their return to Ireland from Ben America. And I suppose I always, you know, it goes, you, you hear about immigration, especially during kind of famine, not long after famine, even up to even to like maybe the 1950s, 60s. And you, as a younger person, you have the concept people never returned. And I discovered myself that my grandmother, my father's mother, returned from America. Um, She returned probably early 1900s because her first child was born 1917, I believe, um, my uncle. And um, I've always wondered, like, a woman in America would have had a serious amount of independence to a woman that was in Ireland at the time. Mm. Never mind a woman then returning from America who probably had a few dollars in her pocket. And then Mari and a man literally had to give all over to him, you know, and I, I would imagine a certain amount of these. I'm, I am thinking I'm taking the. 